Pat, who is your favorite medieval historical figure? Uh, well, my I really I, I really really dig Catherine of Siena, mainly because she she felt disgust right. At, well, I'm probably this is probably wrong. Ella can tell me, but she felt disgust <laughs> at the sight of like postulating lepers, and to kind of atone for her disgust, she drank a big old mug of leper pus. Mmm. So Delicious. she's up. She's up there. Yeah. Yeah. Um. That that's a good one. That's that's a good answer. Actually, I'll take that. Yeah. Absolutely. Like my favorite is that a uh, that king king of Jerusalem. I think it's King Baldwin the whatever who had leprosy. Had leprosy. Who, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. All the weird TikTok fascists are obsessed with. Mm. Of leprosy already. Bring in this it back. Podcast. Bring it back if we're if we are <laughs> returning with a V. To, yeah. Uh, 2011 why don't we return back to 1511 Ooh, if we're saying figure can i i'm gonna go with uh, my favorite medieval figure is saint green for the greyhound who got made a saint by the local community <laughs> and then the local community got in trouble when the church found out but he was just a very <laughs> good boy he was an extremely good boy and he was martyred you know for for the crime of killing a snake that broke into his owner's house. And we love St. Queen for what a good dog, you know, <laughs> I am, I am all for the only form of Catholicism being uh, the sainthood of animals. You're very welcome to beneath the skin, the show about the history of everything told through the history of tattooing. And if you did notice, we have an extra voice on this episode. We are joined to talk about some medieval tattoos, the evidence of or evidence lack thereof by Dr. Eleanor Yaniga. Eleanor, very welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about tattoos, which is, you know, one of my hobbies. So, <laughs> so uh, for anyone who is not interested or that up on medieval history, uh, we're not going to say the Dark Age. We're not going to, we're going to say <laughs> medieval times. The Dark Age refers to the lack of information and sources from the time, not from the lack of knowledge. I was just going to save Thank Eleanor's you. brain cells uh, of having to say that for the millionth time you from my well, own record yeah. of listening to her on other podcasts. So, <laughs> Matt, why don't you take us away as our resident historian? Start to, we're not going to start any academic beef this episode, are we? Oh, always. I really want to. Um, in, f- in fact, <laughs> in fact, actually, this is a quite academic beef, but I have been having me and um, uh, a, uh, another academic who works on early modern tattooing uh, now, I think I've mentioned on the podcast before a guy called Luc Renault in uh, in Grenoble in France, who's amazing. Him and I were talking to a um, uh, another uh, an early modern scholar who's not a tattoo person who was asking us questions uh, and falling into lots of traps about uh, histories of tattooing uh, in the early modern period. So it's nice to kind of get this all cleared up once and for all. Um, I mean, I think you know, as I've said with Eleanor before. The medieval period, the Middle Ages, uh, is a bit of is a bit of a black hole for all kinds of things, um, and so I'm really interested to try and pull out what what evidence we have, and then me to think about like where other where we at, where else we might look. But maybe like the first thing to do is ask you, Eleanor, like when when is the m- medieval period? When yeah. is the Middle Ages? A very good question. So basically, you know, and this is a super Eurocentric answer, but what are you going to do? Um, like, uh, so basically medieval, because it means, you know, the middle ages that presupposes that it's between the ancient period and the modern period, right? So it's the bridge between those. So we tend to start it off with the quote unquote fall of Rome in 475 of Western Rome. I don't believe in the fall of Rome, but you know, whatever, fine. Uh, you you gotta pick a year that's as good as any, why not? Um, and then the end of the medieval period is like, uh, Question mark. Um, so, you know, you, it depends on who you ask. You know, people will say that, um, you know, the unification of Spain and the beginning of the Columbian Exchange uh, and like, you know, trips to the Americas. So 1492 or thereabouts. There you go. That's the end of the medieval period. Uh, people like me, since, you know, I'm a Bohemia specialist, I'm like it eh, by the time, you know, you've got the Hussite Wars and Bohemia is an independent state for me. That's that's the modern period. Um, some people will say, oh, well, if it's the fall of Rome on one side, it's the fall of Constantinople on the other. So 1435. Um, some people will say, well, it's, you know, Martin Luther and, you know, when he comes to prominence in, you know, 1517 or thereabouts. So, you know, these are all 
Fair enough answers, because there's never a period of time when anyone woke up one day and goes, oh, it's a whole, it's a, it's a new period now, everybody. But basic rule of thumb, if you can see Protestants and people are eating potatoes and tomatoes, you've gone too far and you're in the modern period. That's, that, that's how you know. So if you see the ghost of Ian Paisley walking around West Belfast, we're back in the start of the medieval period. Yeah, exactly. exactly. With a bag of potatoes. With a bag of potatoes. The proper ones, Republic of Tatos. <laughs> None of the northern one. So I guess so for tattoo history, that that fourteen ninety two date is super interesting because you know when I think about where the holes in our knowledge about tattooing in Europe are, it's it really is basically between about and even earlier than this, we haven't got a lot, but basically between about. Uh, 1100 like 1066 uh and 1492 so um any earlier than that you know we know a lot about tattooing in ancient rome um you know not a mainstream practice but certainly something that was was known about um we know a lot about a lot about what happens after the contact with the americas and lots of discussions are happening a lot of the discussions in that period in the early uh, uh 16th century are talking about roman sources but there is, yeah, there is this kind of gap, I think, for tattoo knowledge, um, certainly before 1492. And I would say, you know, from a, from about the 11th century onwards, I, I I sort of start my whole, if if that's the right way of putting it, or the real lack of sources with William of Malmesbury's Chronicles of the Kings of England, which is like this really early book on, uh, you know, telling the story of the ancient history of England, which in... Uh, the early 11th century, or sorry, the late 11th century said something like uh, the English had skin adorned with punctured designs uh, which they'd, quote, imparted to their conquerors at the time of the Norman invasion. So the Brits, uh, you know, taught the French how to, how to tattoo. I love that. Love that for the Brits. Fantastic. Love that for the Brits. Mm-hmm. So I guess, can you talk a bit, Eleanor, in that context about about this, like, early early modern or like you know post-roman historiography like what kind of sources are we looking at what do we know what don't we know see this this is the issue right so the post-roman thing is is part of what our problem is because uh that is more specifically the time that historians used to call the dark ages which we don't use that term anymore because everybody doesn't know what it means and we just got mad basically so we're like okay that's it like this is garbage dump it it's not useful to us anymore um and so we don't have a lot of sources for it because it's a really long time ago, you know, and, and that's just kind of like what it boils down to. We do think that there is some kind of tattooing stuff like things will hang around in varying places um, and we will get sources from varying places depending on where you're talking about. But you have all these issues here where it's like in the first place, got six, the year 600 is a real long time ago. You know, like, that's the number one. You're, there's your first problem, right? Uh, your second problem is, um, you know, you've got uh, to keep some sources in a world where there's no electricity and everything's lit by fire. Stuff just burns down a lot. Uh, people with libraries, the stuff burns down a lot. So we, we don't really have a, a great record of things like that. Um and then it's like, well, who's privileged enough to have their sources kept? And then a lot of the time, the answer boils down to, well, the church, right? Because it's a contiguous whole the entire time. Now, having said that, the early medieval church is incredibly weak politically. They don't have a whole ton of power or whatever, but they do have an interest in kind of like retaining power and becoming more powerful. So they keep really good records. And that's kind of like one of the ways that they do it. Um, And the church back and forth is sometimes part of the reason why we don't have sources about tattooing because sometimes the church is really down on it. Yeah. So we were talking, we were talking, uh, uh, over text this week, I I think another really interesting moment for this um, is the uh, synod uh, of Chelsea, the kind of uh, Council of Northumbria, uh, seven eighty seven. So loads of um, does the Pope? No, the Pope doesn't. Does the Pope come to England? Is that like what's is that what's going on? No, like the the Pope don't be coming to England. Come no, on. No, but there's come there's, on, there's like, pa- papal legates, right? Like yeah, papal uh, emissaries. Yeah, legates, yeah. Yeah, emissaries, yeah, yeah. Emissaries of the Pope come. Pope Anthony, is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So and and, uh, and they're laying out these like basically like things you can do, these rules about the things you can do and the things you can't do. 
Um, there's some stuff about goats. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's always um, something like that, you know. Uh, and then, yeah, we have this one of one of this uh, one of one of the things that you're not allowed to do. Um, uh, apparently, so this is the quote: uh, "God formed man beautiful in body and appearance." But pagans at the devil's prompting have superimposed on bodies the most hideous marks. Anyone who sustains this injury of, as they've translated in this modern translation, tattooing, tincturae in Uria, for God's sake, shall have great reward. Great reward. But whoever does it out of the superstition of pagans, it will no more profit him for salvation than bodily circumcision benefits Jews without faith in the heart. So... You've got there basically something that's reflecting that bit in Leviticus about um, thou shalt not make marks on you for the dead. And so this this basically rule is saying, like, don't be doing none of that pagan shit. Yeah, yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's really interesting, right? Because, like, 786 is still this time when, well, that's really all kind of, like, still to play for, right? And so c- certainly, like, the elite in, in England, and you know, Northumbria and places like that. The, the elite are Christian, but you know, if you go down into you know the valleys or whatever in in Northumbria and you ask like your average goat herder, they're kind of going to be like, mm-hmm. you know, and like and maybe <laughs> maybe nominally they're Christian, but they don't really know. You know, they're they're not exactly sure yet because they're still kind of like going along trying to. You know, there's this really conscious desire to kind of emulate Romanness, and, and we see this really often um, in, in kind of like royal sites. So you know, they're, they're kind of like just like ticking over with their things, and you know, in in places like you know where where I work on, like in the the Czechs, they've not they've not Christianized yet. Um, they're getting there, right? They're working on. It. Yeah, like they're they're like, mm. and so for a lot of places at this time, like you know, the Italian Peninsula, sure, that's one thing. France, that's like another one. Like that, that's pretty well, uh, you know, uh, Christianized as is like the Iberian Peninsula, if it's not, you know, like Muslim, indeed. And when, when <laughs> but, they're talking about about pag- when they're talking about pagans, there, who are they talking about? Mm. Good question, because like the, the trouble with uh, medieval Christians, um, especially early medieval ones, is they kind of sort the world into Christians and not, right? <laughs> that, that's kind of like what their deal is. And especially early on, like, you, you know, so like they know who Jews are, right? They know who Jewish people are because they're like, oh, that's the one that we were before. And also we're going to like be anti-Semitic. So we, we, they've got a real they've got a real good idea about being Jewish. Um, but they don't have a real strong idea for a really long time about what various animist religions are like or or what anything like that is. So, and you'll see this even in kind of like the, even in Jesus, as far as into like the 17th century, when you have like Russians encountering, you know, like the people of the taiga in what is now Russia. And they're like, yeah, they're pagans. And when they draw pictures of it, it's like a little like Roman statue on top of a column. And it's like, sure, bro. Yeah. Why, why not? <laughs> you know, like, so like basically if they get confronted with a pantheon, they just go pagan. Right. And then, and then that's like a catch all. And so that could mean a whole lot of things. Right. So they could be in theory, like talking about like some the forms of practice that are still going on, like within Northumbria. They could be talking about um, Scandinavians who do rather a lot of moving around at this point and have yet to Christianize. At this not a lot of ta- not a lot of tattooing happening in this in the Scandies, as far as we know, though. I wonder I wonder if that is a holdover from from this as you said this post roman thing where the romans were very worried about tattooing on for example the thracians and the sarmatians and the scythians and yeah, 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 the people yeah. at the kind of eastern edges of the roman empire and so i i i'm wondering if well it's clear even in the way that that's phrased right that, that they're not particularly worried about the act of tattooing per se and we'll, i guess we'll come to more christian tattooing later on but it's interesting that you know. It's like would would that would that kind of worry about pagans be a kind of hold hold holdover from the Roman Empire? Yeah, I mean that like that makes perfect sense, really, because what they're what you can see that they're kind of doing here, like this is just this classic thing of where they're they're creating an in group and an out group, right? And what they're doing is they're like, this is what we do. We don't do that, right? Like and and, and um, we and they very much, as I say, see themselves as the successors of Rome, and that's their deal, right? Like especially the church. 
the church is it's is particularly like we're still rooted in Rome, we're still attached to Rome. Which you know, my God, the Romans weren't by the time it fell. You know, they were, they'd already fucked off to Ravenna or what what have you. You know, so uh, so like the church are kind of like, well, we're the ones who control Rome, and this is like what to be Christian is kind of like a form of Romanness, and it's something that they go back to constantly, like all the time. They see themselves as kind of the new Rome, and so calling out to that makes perfect sense. Um, and yeah, like whether or not this is really kind of like about, you know, oh, tattooing is bad or whether it's about like what we're doing is we're establishing how Christians behave, how they act. And we're basing that off of Romanness. That that is pretty much yeah. standard medieval behavior. That's super interesting. I mean, because there is there is some there is a lot of kind of online sources which will say that there was a, a later on in one of the le- slightly later um, synods, a kind of complete ban on tattooing. I don't think there's much primary evidence for that but i think this idea yeah that 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 a particular kind of paganness as you said the kind of us versus them stuff is really embedded in that early history um so then like i'm interested then we don't have a huge amount right so tattooing is in in europe is pretty you know pretty invisible for for a lot of the following following centuries um but i guess you know, there's lots of reasons for that, that we've already touched upon. I, I'm interested in how these stories end up feeding into later ideas of identity. So, as I said, you know, the 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 Chronicles of the Kings of England, um, actually from the 12th century. I think I said 11th century earlier on. I mean, the bit in the bit in the Chronicles which are about the 11th century talk about um, talk about yeah that this is some some kind of part of of the history of, of England, let's say, for example, that we were tattooed and then we sort of grew out of it or, or, or got rid of it. Um, there's also something happening with um, some of these later sources, which we'll come to where, where that's also the case. So is there also an idea like here in this conversation about Christianity in the medieval period where like we're on some kind of journey, like away from away from the, the the primitive and away from the kind of quote unquote pagan towards something better yeah i mean absolutely right okay so the thing the thing with medieval europeans right and especially the process of christianization and the the process of becoming a christian is it's also rooted in the fact that christianity fundamentally is a linear religion right and this is something that people like a lot of christians edge away from this now it's like, like if you get like one of the the real wacky american types they'll go all in on this right uh but uh you know christianity is a religion that has a beginning middle and end um you know it sees that you know the beginning of the world started you know with the creation of the world or what have you um then you kind of like the middle was everything before jesus slash jesus and now we are kind of at the end we're hanging out waiting Right. So the idea behind it is that Jesus came. He's going to come again any minute now, like any second. He's going to show back up and then the world is going to be over. And so we're on that timeline, right, where what we're supposed to be doing is being like the optimum Christians and establishing ourselves as kind of like the right in group before the world ends. Right. Before before you get to, to the end of time. And and there is this real thing within that of kind of like establishing. So especially like going back to like the Scythians and, and people like that, that the Romans have real horrors of. There is a direct identification of kind of like uh, people on the uh, e- in the east, like especially out on the, the steps and things like that with uh, the hordes of Gog and Magog. Is what they're called, which are the kind of like some monsters that are going to show up at the end of the world. And, you know, uh, there's this idea that uh, Alexander the Great, like, built big gates to keep them behind and that uh, they will eventually break through the gates and, like, come through. Right. So if we think about, you know, the step people and their interest in tattooing, right, as being identified as being almost demonic. Right. And this source of real angst and anxiety in a world that needs to Christianize as rapidly as possible before Judgment Day it start it, it makes more sense right and this is this is also there where that where that p- part of that particular synod goes on right like quote you you wear clothes in the manner of the pagans whom your forefathers with their weapons by god's help drove out of the world um so yeah there i i think there is this idea of like okay if you're going to do tattooing do it for jesus uh, or I guess yeah. not for Jesus, not yeah, for Jesus in the eighth century, but for do it for do it for God, do it for God. Don't do it for don't do it for um for this filthy pagan stuff. 
Do you, can you talk a bit about the about these ideas about the body as well, how that relates to that? Because I think this is also going to be a theme we'll come back to, right? Yeah, so like this is this is a huge part of it, right? So a, a big thing too is like if you understand that the world is going to end, and you know you're 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 waiting for that. A big part of this is that on Judgment Day, which is you know kind of at the end of the world, um, it's like a bunch of bad stuff's going to happen. Then there's going to be Judgment Day, and then the the world's like Black collapse, Friday. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what and what's going to happen at that point in time is everybody is going to get up out of their grave. Your soul's going to go back into your body and you're going to get up back out of your grave. Now, when you do it, you're also going to be kind of like at your physical peak or whatever. It's not going to really necessarily be like your body as it was alive, but you need you need your body to be intact. Right. So are you going to be at your physical peak or are you going to be at physical peak? Like, is like, it going to be as best as you got in life or are you going to be a, the best ver- the best version of yourself? I think, I need like to, I'm, it's, I'm it's asking sort of like, for a friend. It's the best for, It's the best version of yourself. I, it's like the best possible version of humans because it, this is also really okay. funny because it's like, don't, don't, don't worry, there's some sexist shit in here. So, uh, <laughs> like, uh, so women, when they get up out of the graves, are going to be in their 20s and men, when they get up out of their graves, are going to be kind of like middle age, so around about 40. Because that's kind of like considered physical peak for for. I'm wondering if I need for my afterlife to be getting my crunches in. Because as yeah, Tom knows, yeah. I'm, no, but I'm, like that's just going to happen for you. Oh like, great, you okay. Yeah, you don't good. need to worry about that. So that's so that's, that's going to rise up out of the grave with like shredded cheese grater abs. <laughs> yeah, just like he's going to have cum gutters. It's going to be you know like it's the whole nine yards. Yeah. I've never heard that phrase before. You haven't. What? Oh, there you go. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad I could so, ruin that for you. We're all so- learning. <laughs> So, so, uh, so is is there there's this idea? Is there a, like you know, again to quote from that thing? God, uh, to to quote from that synod, uh, God formed man beautiful in body and appearance. Yeah, yeah. So what you're what they're saying that is like you're you're supposed to show up out of your grave, you know, beautiful in body and appearance. And if you've gone around messing with it, then you, God's not going to like that. You know, to quote. To quote Santa Claus uh, from, you know, his interview for the, I'm going to I think you should leave references now, you know, like it, it's not not it's not good behavior. Right. Like cause that's, that's what it comes down to. So it's like if you're if you're kind of like attempting to to like, you, you know, your body's got to show up and be peak. That's what it's going to be now. And there's a lot of toing and froing about this, about like if you lose a limb in your life, will it be reattached to your answer? Yes. Things like that, but you know, they, these are the kind of theological questions that keep them up at night. And there's something more specifically here about tattooing that is like, well, you did it on purpose, right? So it's it's the decision making to do that to your own body that is a problem. And we think that there may have been instances in which people were kind of like tattooed against their will, sort of like forcibly. Well, we the, know, Roman, I, the Romans, the Romans certainly did, did do that. that. Yeah, right. and the Greeks did that, and the Persians did that, and the Chinese did that. And we think that that kind of like hangs around for a while, especially when you have. I mean, like slavery does happen like within medieval Europe more generally, but especially in the earlier period when you got a lot of like Viking slavers and things like that, um, we do think that that hangs around a little bit, um, you know, kind of as a form of punishment. But that's also kind of different. Because you see what it's it's doing both things, right? So if you're being tattooed against your will, it's marking you as an out group, which is the idea, right? Like the, the entire point is that you're being an out group. If you're going to be in the in group, you have to not be doing that, and you you don't do this voluntarily, right? So it's it's kind of like the idea here is that it's an affront to God because what you're saying is that you can improve on what God was doing, and you know that's not a good thing. Um, and one thing, like obviously with the absence of tattooing and the marking of like in-group and out-group, what kind of replaced, or not necessarily replaced, but filled the gap that tattooing would have had in sort of physical ornamentation and adornment, or even just like the presentation of self? Oh, mate, like they're into fashion. Hardcore. Tell me. Like, oh yeah, okay, so like, many will be able to... Matt's going to be on eBay trying to Google this stuff. He's going to try and buy four, like... 11th century moccasins. Yeah. 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 It it changes over the period, right? So as the medieval period goes on, like fashion, like it's more and more complex and more complicated, right? Um, So they kind of start out, you know, still hanging out, wearing togas, etc. Although when the Franks kind of take over everything, you do suddenly have stuff like um, 
you know, breeches instead of, you know, people wearing togas, which is very barbaric and et cetera, et cetera. And you shouldn't do it, blah, blah. Uh, but uh, you do kind of have like, it, at first, garments kind of start out being about a bit of a rough tee. And then it's kind of like on top of that, you have other, um, you have like other endless stuff like uh, you will then slash things. This is big, sort of like cut into clothing so that it's like you've got cloth under the cloth, cloth under the cloth, baby. Right. So it's like slash sleeves that have like two different colors. That's a big thing. Um, party colored clothing becomes really big. So it's like, ooh, part of it's red and part of it's yellow. You like that? You like that? You know, they're they're really into that. Um, pointed shoes. Yeah, you like, yeah, point shoes, heels. We love heels. Um, wearing furs is a really big thing. Uh, things of this nature, right? So um, you have like all this kind of like very ostentatious dressing. And, you know, we, we learn more and more about it as the period goes on. And like as the period goes on, by the time it gets to the late medieval period, they have to bring in laws about it. Because uh, they're like, <laughs> these poor people are dressing too fancy. And like, you can't, how dare you? Go around looking like you might be rich, right? Like that's that's one thing that people do. Jewelry is a big part of this. Back in your box, peasants. Basically, basically, it's like the the peasants start living too fine. Is this kind of around the solidif solidification of a kind of social class? Then that obviously, if you can afford to buy multiple different colors of fabrics, that you're going to show it off. Whereas, like I suppose, prior to the medieval age. Tattooing would have been done by people who would have been quite skilled at it, so that in and of itself would have been a status symbol if you had a yeah. well done tattoo, like well, yeah. today. Yeah, like like today, you know, like having really nice tattoos, like that's a, that's a form of status, obviously. Um, you know, like all you have to do is make friends with a couple of Maori people, and oh my god, they're Taimokos. Like my friends with Taimokos, it's like, hoo hoo, whoa, you know, uh, it's like, like it's incredible stuff. Uh, but you know, for them, it, it, the way they flex, it has a lot to do with cloth. Like cloth is intensely important. Uh, to medieval Europeans and like essentially wool is like the biggest commercial luxury good um, and it's it's what like Europe is known for and it's the thing that other people want from Europe right it's like Europe isn't necessarily good for uh, like a lot of exported stuff but like wool people want wool right uh, because and, and everyone here is really good at it and they're good at making cloth right so um what that means in terms of fashion is that like one of the big ways to flex is just to wear as much cloth as is humanly possible. And so it's like <laughs> the, the way that they're like showing off, they're like, yeah, you like that big sleeve? No reason. Big sleeve. You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so you, you just like put on as much cloth as you possibly get. And that, and that, and that shows that you're wealthy, right? Because it's like, you're just wasted. it. There's absolutely no reason why you need that much cloth, but you're doing it anyway. Whereas a, a more, you know, a poorer person is just going to have to, you know, nip everything in and be wearing kind of things as, as much as they can. But having said that, they're still big, especially kind of like in the 14th century, they're still big on tight clothes. Um, there's a lot of the church getting mad and like accusing them of uh, bringing down the Black Death on everybody because everybody's dressing too sexy. And they're like, everyone's dressing too slutty now. It's like being called gay in 2010 for wearing skinny jeans. Exactly. Exactly. And so it's like, and, and that is, there is kind of like a thing there where it's like, if you're a dude and you're too into fashion, they're like, you're, you're, you're being like a woman and that's gay. You know, like they don't have a concept of gay, but you know, if you start behaving like a woman, then that means that you're going to like try to shag everyone immediately. Um, and like indiscriminately. And so like, you know, they're, they're essentially like, yeah, that's gay. Um, so well, yeah, I, maybe, maybe on that, maybe on that, on that, um, front, I want to, I want to skip forward from where we were with in the eight, in the, uh, eighth century to uh, what some of the next really important, like discussions of tattoos, probably the most extensive we have in the, in the, this period, which is from Marco Polo, right? The 13th century when Marco Polo like toddles off to China and to um, Vietnam uh, and to like that part of the world to kind of hang out with Genghis Khan. Um, Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, Kublai Khan, mm -hmm. Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan. In That's Xanadu, kind of did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, <laughs> etc. I learned all my history from... Yeah, there you go. That's fine. But yeah, yeah, Kublai Khan. disco. Um, so... What's what's the influence of that kind of um, contact of the, the 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 medieval world with with Asia? Because we have these these you know Marco Polo's um, diaries get 
written initially in Italian and then throughout the period they're translated into other languages, into Spanish, they get translated into English um, by the 16th century, so a bit later than what we're talking about. But uh, I think knowledge about tattooing and certainly when the Ameri- when Europeans encounter tattooed people in the Americas, their instant reaction is like, oh, these are like those Tartars that we've heard about, mm-hmm, which are, mm-hmm. by which they mean people basically in kind of the, the Near East. East. Yeah. 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 So, so what's going on with that stuff? So this is quite interesting, right? Because um, Marco Polo going over there, you know, he's got, he's got these great diaries. He kind of talks about these things. And this starts a bit of a sensation. Um, on the part of uh, Christians and Christians are like, hot damn, we got to get over there and Christianize people, which is very funny (laughs) uh, because there are Christians over there. They're just not like Roman Christian. You know, they're not like we'd say Catholic now, but they don't have a concept of Catholic at the time. Right. Well, there is, Um, you know, for example, there is a St. Michael tattoo on the inner thigh of a naturally preserved mummy from Sudan from mm. around the time of, 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 of that 8th century. So, yeah, 400 years before in North Africa, there's Christians with badass tattoos. Yeah, there is like there is like some argument that the Coptic Christians um, continue to um, to do tattoos and like that, that this mummy is part of it. And there there's, there is, for example, like a tattooing family of Coptic uh, Christians who still lives in Jerusalem. There are. And they, cl- they claim... That they were tattooing people like during the Crusades and like people they who went on they to pilgrimage, they weren't, but they, they weren't, weren't doing that. No. They were not doing the, that. The earliest I mean, like, again, we'll come to that. The earliest evidence I think we have of that kind of stuff is in the like late 16th century, so like 15. Yeah, and it's like it's just it's just not true. It's just not true. It's a real cute story, and I love it for them. Uh, but like, it's just we have absolutely no evidence of that at all whatsoever, which isn't to say that we don't have evidence of Coptic Christians having tattoos. We do. We we just don't have any of it being linked to Jerusalem or the pilgrimage routes or whatever. But anyway, this is neither here nor there. Like, so circling back. So one of the things that happens is they're like, okay, quick, we got to, come on, everybody. We're, we're Christianizing China. Like, get in, losers. We're, <laughs> we're Christianizing China. And so- um, Let's they, go! They send, like, they send Franciscans out. And this is quite funny because it's like we have these great diaries of these Franciscans kind of going going east um, and they start meeting, you know, various of like, you know, the Mongol Khans and, and such. Like that. And the Mongol Khans are very nice to them where it's like hilarious. They kind of like show up and they're in the snow, like wearing their sandals and stuff. And the Mongol Khans are like, what's all um, nice sandals? Are you OK? <laughs> you know, and, and they're all like, take me now to your leader. I must like tell him the good news of Christianity. And they're like, got to uh got an orthodox guy who works for me uh okay (laughs) okay but it's like the way the franciscans write about it is really really funny because again you see this thing where they cannot differentiate between religions they're unfamiliar with so we think that a lot of the people that they're kind of writing about are probably buddhist they call them pagans Right. They're where they're they're just like, well, these are these are pagans. These are pagans. And sure, you know, there's a lot to be said specifically like with our uh, Mongolian friends about how you have kind of like animist things overlapping with Buddhism. And, you know, sure, like I'm Vajrayana Buddhist myself. We sure do be having a lot of gods and stuff like well, that's that's our hobby. Those are our emotional support <laughs> gods and we need them. Right. Um so, the, but but they just get confused by this, and they just go blind, and they're like pagans, and and so that can also be confusing because a lot of them are Muslim, right? Or you know when they're talking about like Hindu people, for example, that's it's just they're just like ah pagan, right? So we do know that they understand tattooing, but they're still they're still going to this thing like they're reaching into their grab bag, which is like not Roman, not Christian therefore pagan therefore tattooing is this kind of like otherworldly vaguely demonic kind of ideal and how much of that knowledge or how much of that storytelling from polo and other explorers is is getting into i I guess uh, maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm guessing not much of it gets into kind of mainstream perceptions but certainly there would have been a class of people that knew about some of this stuff and you know like it it was it's, it's, it's interesting to me that as soon as as soon as Europeans encounter you know, whether they're Spanish or whether they're Italian or whether they're English or whatever, when they're encountering tattooed people in the Americas, they're like, "Oh, these are like those Asians we've heard about for a while." So, so how how does that knowledge get circulated in an age before the printing press? Like, how how are people hearing about this stuff? 
Well, so it's quite interesting because medieval people have great ways of kind of circulating ideas even before the printing press. And sometimes like the printing press can be a little bit over egged. You know, the thing that the printing press allows you to do is it allows you to do stuff more quickly. Right. That, that isn't to say that stuff doesn't exist. So like a big way that things are circulated in the medieval period are a word of mouth. Um, and medieval people love to talk, right? So it's like somebody will read a thing and then they'll go tell everybody about it and everyone goes, wow, that's like, that's really cool, right? So these are sort of things that get picked up by like uh, groups of actors, um, you know, like that they will do like a plays about, you know, the exoticism of the East, things like that. Um, you also will see that there are ways of circulating texts. Um, there's a really cool system uh, called the Pikia system which is very interesting where it's like people will have text. So they'll be, it's like essentially owning a bookshop, but what it is, you own a bunch of texts and then you rent them out to people who then go like really quickly, go copy their own copy and then they give it back to you. Right. And so like, that's a big way that text spread and it's really effective. That. Yeah, like allowing well, it's really like, clear. I mean, it's really clear that people at least haven't it had an image of you know, I, I, people people in in Britain had a had an image of the people people in the past and people from elsewhere <laughs> as having tattoos. And I mean, this, and here's here's the thing about uh, Europeans is like you know there there's this tendency to kind of see like medieval Europe is completely isolated, which is which is wrong. Like it's just wrong. Like that that's not true, and that, that's not. The, and granted, Marco Polo was you know one of the best to ever do it, and he went over and he's got all of these you know great stories. But he was following like established caravan routes. It wasn't like new. Yeah. You know, right. he was just like he was just one of the guys who who managed to do it right. And he, this also makes sense. Is like, look, in a world where like, come on, seventy percent of the European population isn't free at this point in time. You know, like they're they're not enslaved, but you know they're serfs. They can't just be like, hey, I'm gonna go to China, buy. You know, like because that's illegal. Right. Like you can't go off and do that. But they are really interested in where things come from. They really understand themselves as being connected to the rest of the world. They have stuff like spices and silks and stuff that come over from the east. Like it's not unusual uh, to be loved by anyone, A. But B, uh, for like, a, you know, medieval people to have like uh, cloves or to have nutmeg. And, you know, nutmeg only comes from Indonesia, but is now Indonesia. Right. So it's like it, and these, these are things that people have and they understand that it comes from Asia and they know where Asia is. They know it's to the east. You just can't necessarily like haul off and go over there. Um, so the, it, it isn't to say that, that it's just like, oh, wow, you know, there's nothing over there. But that's interesting to them. They're like, oh, you know, the exotic east and isn't that fun and isn't that magic. Right. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, this this, sort of this is something that really interests me as well because uh, you know a lot of the stories about tattooing, not just in, you know, earlier too in the Roman period as well, they start off of like either quite general things like oh these people were blue, you know, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah, 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 and yeah. then that becomes this huge story of hyper tattooing. Or actually, what happens with Marco Polo is sort of the opposite. Like, I want to read this quickly because this is so amazing. This is from uh, about uh, between 1271 and 1295, um, talking about tattooing in Vietnam. So he says, All the people, both men and women, are painted from head to toe in the way which I tell you. They have pictures made with needles all over their skin, depicting lions and dragons and birds and many other forms, um, and done in such a way that they are indelible. They have them on their faces, their necks, their bellies, their hands, their legs, and everywhere else. This is the procedure. To begin with, the person being painted has the various images he has chosen sketched out in black all over his body. This done, he's tied hand and foot and held down by two or more men. The artist takes five needles, four fastened together in the form of a square and the fifth in the centre, and starts prick, you know, good old mag, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> from, yeah, fair enough. From the 13th century. Um, uh, starts pricking the client all over, following the outlines of the drawings. The instant the pricks have been made, Ink is applied to them, and eventually the figure is sketched uh, and appears in these pricks. Meanwhile, the client suffers such agonies they might be thought sufficient to serve out purgatory. In fact, many of them die while they're under the needle and they lose a great deal of blood. Right? But but that's a super specific story about something that's definitely tattooing, right? It's it's putting ink in the skin with needles. Sometimes those stories, and I, I was as you were talking about um stories coming from Asia, this is why I uh, this came to mind. There's this, uh, that's that stuff again, the, that guy that I was talking with you about over text the other day, John Mandeville, um, who's a kind of English uh, English chronicler, um, who's sort of, 
uh, so he's writing between 1357 and 1371, so about 100 years later. Um, it's like the, this is like my favorite area of time. I'm like the perfect time. Yes. Yeah. So he's <laughs> so he's maybe like reading Marco Polo. Like there's lots of theories about who he was. A kind of maybe a French guy pretending to be English or something. But his his version of tattooing, or what may even be tattooing, um, I think it's a bit debatable whether it is or not. But basically, his version of it is a bit more um, like, oh, there's there's some marks here. Like, and I know in in basically in Indonesia, um, or you know the bit of the world that is now Indonesia, he's like, oh, they've got like, uh, here we go, the folk. So it's about Java. The folk of that isle make them always to be marked in the visage with with a hot iron. Both men and women, for great noblesse, be known from other folk. So that that's a much less specific story because he's like he's not been and seen it and like documented it. He's just like, oh, I heard about this stuff that's happening. And I'm going to write it down. Is that is that like is that a reasonable kind of account of like how how knowledge is transmitted? Like people like people are reading books and it's a very medieval thing. Like so because that's like what chronicles are a lot of the time. And that we can use chronicles. Like you have to be so careful with chronicles. Like they're 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 one of these sources, right? Where it's like they do tend to kind of like give you stuff that existed or things that happened. They tend to do it in the right order. Um, they tend to be written for real particular people and you have to like be worried about like, well, who ordered this made and why, and why is it interested in portraying people in this way? Um, and sometimes they just do, they'd be making stuff up, you know, like if they, if they've heard like a, well, you know, if they've heard about a miracle or they've heard about something interesting, they're like, oh yeah, that definitely happened. Right. But word of mouth is a big thing for medieval people. And indeed like memory systems about like based on that is is a huge thing, right? The way they think about memory and the way that they think about knowledge is a lot of the time specifically oral because it has to be, right? Like, I mean, they, they're the people who have the, the, the ability to write things down, which is why we get to hear from them, but the great majority of people don't. Um, so it is kind of like a game of telephone, right? Where it's like, well, he heard that in Java, they do this thing and he's like, I probably with hot irons. And that's probably because like they, he's aware of branding. Right. And so he's like, right. it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. so it's like, oh, oh, well, if we're marking the skin, that must be branding. It must have to do with a hot iron. So you probably heard that there's this way of marking the skin, then just went, the thing I know about is this. So I'm I'm assuming like, you know, it, it's logical. It makes a certain amount of sense, you know? Right. Yeah, that's super, that's super interesting. Hey, are you enjoying the show? If you really like Beneath the Skin and you want to help support us, you can do so on Patreon. For little as five quid a month, you can help make this show possible, help us buy research materials. So if you like the show and you want to support us, consider kicking us a few quid a month and you'll get everything from bonus episodes to Q&As and you can even vote on what tattoo I'll get when we reach a certain subscriber count. Matt, have you got anything to say? You should really definitely uh, fund the Patreon because tattoo history is massive, right? Deep, wide, complicated. We're covering some big hit topics on the main feed, but on the Patreon subscriber only feed, we'll be getting into some really more interesting niche, deep topics you don't want to miss out on. And honestly, the chance to kind of decide what Thomas gets on his body is probably just a once in a lifetime opportunity. Subscribe, chuck us a few quid. Don't miss out on the chance to ruin Thomas's body forever. Everyone knows that tattoo aftercare is one of the most important steps in getting a new tattoo. We all want our fresh new tattoos to heal as easily and hassle-free as possible so we can show them off to the world. That's why Saniderm's here to help. Driven by science and innovation, Saniderm products have been thoroughly tested and used by doctors and tattoo artists alike for over 10 years. Saniderm brings cutting edge technology to make your tattoo healing process a breeze. No more messing around with cleaning and plastic every few hours with Saniderm's amazing range of aftercare products. I personally have used Saniderm to heal my tattoos in the past and they made what used to be a daily process of setting reminders on my phone to clean and rewrap my tattoo into a one-step process. Their medical grade products include aftercare balms, soaps, and my favorite, their second skin aftercare bandages. Saniderm's tattoo bandages are designed to be waterproof, breathable, and keep your new tattoo protected from whatever the elements can throw at it so you can get on with your day worry-free 
and confident your new tattoo will look vibrant and will heal faster. Plus, their products are all natural and ethically sourced, so you can take comfort in knowing that you're healing your tattoos with nature's finest ingredients. So next time you're in an artist's chair, why not try Saladerm, healing your tattoos the modern way so you can get on with your day. Check out the link in the description of this episode for discounts on a range of Saladerm products or for more information. Okay, I'm really, I could talk to you forever, Eleanor, but I'm really aware of like time. <laughs> I want to talk about so um uh this guy uh this guy Henry Suso. Mm, so how do you how do you yeah <laughs> such a pain slot. Had you heard about him before? Did you know much about him? Yeah, I had. Yeah, okay, right. so because I've got to Do you want to wanna... tell the story then of who he was and Okay, so he's gunning for sainthood. That's his right. deal. He's, go- he's going hard. He's going and he's going hard for Saint Hood. And this is like a real common thing. Um, so he's a other- he's a German guy, right? And he's living yeah. in around what again the like early early twelve hundreds. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah, look yeah. this up specifically. I, I think to that's get this right. right. Yeah, I think he's thirteenth century. And yeah. um, so because uh, I know about him for 14th two reasons. century. There we go. Yeah. Twelve ninety five. Yeah. So he was born at the end of the thirteenth century. There we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. So it's like so it's very much like my shit, right? And you get you get a lot of these people. <laughs> you get a lot of these people in the fourteenth century. So this is a big thing. So and I'm I'm obsessed with two things. Um, I'm I'm one of well no I'm obsessed with many things, but some of my sidelines of assumptions are, um, I really really love people who want to be saints and who don't make it. I'm really interested in those guys who like go really hard and it doesn't happen for them. Like it's very very funny uh to me like i love like the soundcloud rappers of the 14th century right like those are my people i really appreciate their work um and also i'm interested in kind of like the history of bdsm and these kind of like things oh, this, often. Guy, this guy this, and this guy uh, this guy's like right and he is just like the venn diagram is a circle baby um, so he wants to be a saint and so the his understanding of what you've got to do there is that you one needs to mortify the body um, and that's common. Like people do this all the time. And it, it is, it is. Yeah. If you're going for sainthood, that's one of the things to do. You do things like wear hair shirts. He does that tick, uh, but he's all like, Oh no, the hair shirt, which is, you know, like a big itchy garment. That's going to like ruin your skin and your life. Right. He's like, no, that's not enough. He makes himself like this special underwear that has like needles in it and like bits of broken glass. And he's all like, that's my needle and glass underwear, which God yeah, he wants makes, me to wear. Doesn't he make, doesn't he make pants that like have brass nails yeah, facing yeah. inwards? I want to read this out because this is from yeah, his it. writings. <laughs> so good. Um, so this is this is the kind of chronicle of his life written around the time uh, that, that this was all happening. Um, <laughs> In his youth, he was very lively by nature. When this became evident to him, he noticed he was over- being overwhelmed by it. He found this bitter and difficult. He saw all kinds of remedies and practiced rigorous penances to make the flesh subject to the spirit. For a long ch- t- time, he wore a hair shirt with an iron chain until he bled like a fountain and had to give it up. For his lower body, he had an undergarment of hair made secretly with thongs, worked into which 150 pointed nails had been attached. They were brass and had been filed sharp. The points of these were turned towards his body. He would tighten the garment around him, binding it together in the front so it would fit more tightly against his body, and the pointed nails would press into his flesh. The garment was made long enough to reach up to the navel. He would sleep in it at night. In summer, when it was hot, he was tired from having to travel on foot and had become weak, or when he'd gone for bloodletting and was lying a captive into his own misery and tortured by vermin. He would sometimes lie there groaning to himself and gnashing his teeth. Yeah, he used like, to. Feed, he had worms living in his hair shirt, and he used to feed them to make them more like to keep them there. And, and part of the reason that he had this is that he refused to bathe for twenty five years, uh, which is a useful piece of information because you know when people go medieval, people didn't bathe. Like, eh, yes, they did, but but we tend to know these stories about people who didn't. But when people are not doing it, it's because they're trying to be holy, and because they're like God hates bodies, and so I hate my body, so I'm going to be as uncomfortable as is humanly possible. And everyone is like. This dude stinks. So he's got like worms in the holes. He's like, he's just going for it. And he's like, Jesus loves this. And then hilariously, my favorite, my favorite bit about it is that at the end of his life is he's like, you know, I think maybe I was making that up. (laughs) Yeah. And that God doesn't want this. And it's like, you you think, buddy? (laughs) He's talking about the being eaten by the worms, right? So he says like, 
Those that murders or large animals kill kill quickly and have it over and done with. But I like lie here dying in the midst of these nasty creatures. So he's like, this isn't enough. I need more. I need to kick this up a notch. So he's like, in order not to get any relief from this suffering, he thought of something else. He bound a part of a belt around his neck, right, uh, and cleverly attached it to two rings of leather. Into these he slipped his hands, so hot, and locked his arms inside with two curtain fasteners. The keys he put on a board near the bed until he got up for matins and unlocked himself. So to get the keys to get out of his bedroom, he had to strangle himself every morning. His arms were each drawn upwards in their bonds to his throat, and he made the lock so secure that if his cell had been burning, he could not have helped himself. Um, then, then he thought of something else. He had someone make him two leather gloves like the labourers wear. Um, <laughs> then he had a tinsmith fasten pointed tacks. These he's put on at night. He did this, so if in his sleep he just take off his undergarment or hair shirt or get relief from the biting vermin, the tacks would prick him. And it worked. <laughs> While asleep, when he tried to use his hands to help himself, he would run pointed tacks into his chest and scratch himself. Um, Normal. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah, then he says, Afterward, when his blood had been cooled, his nature crushed, there appeared to him a vision, a heathery gathering, that announced to him that God no longer wanted this of him. He put an end to it and (laughs) threw everything into a river. He was throwing like, his spiked pants into a river. Which, what I love about that is I do, <laughs> the, the thing that really interests me about it is that um, I think that he kind of came to terms with the fact that, like, he was getting something out of this. Oh, yeah. Right? You know, like, like the idea that he's like, oh, maybe God doesn't want this. Like, to me, that's kind of indicative of a realization that he's kind of getting an erotic kick out of it, is my argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, um, where it was, where it's like this is this is more than this is not about holiness anymore, is it, buddy? Like this is you you are doing something else. There's loads of other stuff he's doing, but in lots of his the images of him, uh, you can see him basically like it's it's. I think to call it tattooing is probably not quite right. Although we, you know, this this is why I wanted to talk about this comparison between like branding and scarification and tattooing because in all of the images he's basically like poking himself with a with a needle with a sharpened instrument of some kind putting the christogram which i can tell us what it is in a second onto his body this ihs and so this all of these images of him from the 13th century all the way onwards actually right into the renaissance is him doing this image on his chest and again i'll read you this so chapter four how how he inscribed the beloved name of jesus on his heart um so One day, as it came over him and divine love surged up in him. This is great. So sexy. Mm. Oh, we've Uh, all been there. He went into his cell, his hiding place, and he entered into loving contemplation and and said, Gentle God, if only I could think up a sign of love that would give testimony as an eternal symbol of the love between you and me, one that no forgetting could ever erase. In this state of fervent earnestness, he threw aside his scapula, bared his breast, and took a stylus in hand. Looking at his heart, he said, God of power, give me today strength and power to carry out my desire, for today you'll be engraved in the ground of my heart. And he began to jab into the flesh above his heart with the stylus in a straight line. He jabbed back and forth, up and down, until he'd drawn the name IHS right above his heart. Because of the sharp stabs, blood poured profusely from his flesh and ran over his body down his chest. Because of the burn, because of because of his burning love, he enjoyed seeing this and hardly noticed the pain. After yeah. he'd done this, after he'd done this, he went exhausted, and um, uh, went exhausted and bleeding to his cell. Um, kneeling down, he said, "My lord and love of my heart, look at my the intense desire." Um, the name IHS remained over his heart as he'd wished. The letters were about as thick as a flattened out blade of grass, as long as a section of his little finger. He carried the name over his heart until his death. And as often his heart beat, the name moved. So there's loads more, but like, talk me through that, Eleanor. What's going uh, that, on there? That, but that's just like a, a Yukio Mishima novel right there. Right. My favorite bit is him trying to get aftercare from Jesus. He's like, he's like, Jesus, I've just done this big scene. Do you like it? You know, it's like, which is interesting. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Like, so in the first place we could talk about Christograms, which is interesting because there's a couple different kinds that you can have. Um, so the older kind is the Chiro, which is like a P with an X. 
through it. Um, and you usually get the alpha and omega along with it. So as you know, these things kind of like, uh, they, as it kind of like indicates, um, what, what you get here is you've got like, um, Greek letters that like mean like, you know, Jesus Christ, right? Like essentially. So like good, good for this. Um, we see these sometimes then like amalgamated into, for example, early medieval English runes. Uh, you'll, you'll get stuff like that, but the major, uh, the major version is the IHS or IHC. Um, and this, as a general rule of thumb, it just means Jesus. Uh, and there's a couple reasons why this kind of like comes up. So the first of all is that, you know, you got to understand that in the medieval period, like paper doesn't exist. Um, and like what you're doing whenever you're writing on things is you're writing on parchment and parchment is animal skin, right? Like it's treated animal skin. So you don't be writing out full words uh, because it's really expensive to write things down. And so everything is kind of done in shorthand, right? So when you have to lose, when you are an idiot and you become a medieval historian like me, like major mistake, huge mistake, um, you have to learn essentially the medieval shorthands along with these things. And one of the big ones is just like when they want to say Jesus, they'll be like IHS, right? Now this is connected more specifically to um, interesting kind of like uh, Greek things. Um, so it's like, it's the first because like it, the the IHS or IHC, it doesn't really matter. They're interchangeable at the time. Um, are kind of like synonymous with the first three letters of it in Greek, which is like um iota, eta, and sigma, right? Um, and so it also just kind of looks a bit like IHS or IHC to Latin speakers, which is a little bit like Jesus Christi, uh, like. J H, you know, like something like that in there. Uh, so, like for Latin speakers, there's a little bit of something as well. Um, and so it's just it just means Jesus. It's like a way of writing down Jesus. And they are big on this. Like, so the reason why, for example, we'll be like Xmas now is that like one of the, the instead of like writing down Christ, you just put an X a lot of the time. So like the the yeah like and it's because they're always doing shorthand they're always like going on with this and so my man here it's hilarious because it's like here's a little bit of like manas like here here's a dude who's literate right here's a dude who's literate because he's like this is how you write you know like he doesn't go he doesn't like write out Jesus he's like I H S baby yeah like you know and like and he puts it down there so it's like and he's getting around the thing about tattooing right he's getting around it because yeah. you can scarify yourself. Well, you could also, I guess, I guess, I guess, yeah, things have changed probably in the 500 years since that papal legate, but like, this is proper tattering for Jesus. Like, he's, he's like, I did this for you. He even says, you know, um, like, oh, uh, there's a lot of people that sew their lovers' names into their clothing. So this is like that, but I'm doing it for you, Jesus. Like, so could you, can you talk a bit about, uh, because obviously the fa the famous one that I know about, uh, my my I grew up a very my my nan was Catholic, but a very she I used to see that like, last five minutes of mass because my nan was always late to mass. <laughs> so I was not I was not raised a Catholic, but I I had some sort of very very you know fringy edge Catholic Catholicism in my growing up. And my aunt is called Teresa, so I knew about Saint Teresa and you know the kind of paradigmatic like horny saint. Um, but what what's with this? What's with this whole like? I want to marry you. Oh, I want to, I love you. I, I want to, right. Can you, can you tell us about that? Yeah. They're, they're mad horny for Jesus. Uh, like, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like it's, it's, it, and, and they just are. Okay. Like, and it comes up all the time, a big way that they seem to interpret, uh, the afterlife and paradise is that like, you get to fuck Jesus. Even if you're a man. Uh, yeah, because like, it doesn't matter, like you'll, you'll be in ecstasy with him. So it's like, you know what that ecstasy is, is like when it's women, they're more specifically like, you're the bride of Christ. You get to marry Jesus. Isn't that lucky? But they, the way that they talk about ecstasy is overtly sexual quite a lot of the time. And we see this all the time in varying ways. Like, and you see this, you see this like constantly to the point where you'll have people who are gunning for sainthood who like uh they th this is a woman but like during mass she just freaks out and like climbs the crucifix and attempts to like make out with the statue of jesus uh you see like people who have like again from an s m perspective which is like how i know about it people who will have like these uh, really vivid scenes of jesus coming down off the cross and they like give him aftercare 
where they like dress his wounds and make out with him a little bit and stuff like that. Like, and, and, they'll, and they'll be like, and then we kissed and then we made out. Um, there's a really big thing um, about where there will be images of Christ's side wound, which just looks like a vulva, okay? Like when it's written down. And like for meditative purposes, people will like kiss and stroke these images. And we know that because we've done analysis on them and we there's like spit on these like books and stuff <laughs> when people are just like kissing the Christ pussy, you know, like they're just like right up in there. Um, and it, it's just like, it, it just fundamentally is a true thing that when someone says, okay, well, I, I'm a nun or whatever, and I'm dedicating myself to Christ and my bride of Christ, they, they mean it. They mean it. And sometimes men mean it as well. Um, and, you know, it's, of course, this is like a very modern perspective. I'm telling you it's sexual, but I'm like, I'm sorry, why are you making out with Jesus right now? Like, we're still, yeah. you still have a body. Because I think, and again, the- as, someone who's not a, as someone who's not a medievalist at all, um, that description that I just read, you know, where he's talking about love, like that, that really seems to uh, not even analogize, like conflate sexual love or some kind of erotic love, at least, if not exactly sexual, with 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 romantic love. You know, I said he actively compares this to like, you know, lovers lovers who've inscribed the names of their beloved on their clothes, like so that this isn't just a kind of like. You know, these these aren't different things, right? Erotic love no. and, and love for Jesus. They're, 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 they're the same yeah, in like, some contexts. If people are tr- attempting to resist it, which we've seen for years upon years upon years, right? Um, so people like now we're finally getting around to being like, yeah, it seems they were horny for Jesus. Like, congratulations. You, you know, like we're, we're finally like ready to admit that a little bit at the moment. Um, and the way that you got around that in the past is you would say ecstatic, love so you know which is which is to say like to talk about ecstasy right um and but it it was always euphemistic if we're being honest you know and 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 what i would say about that is like well certainly it is ecstatic but it's also like incredibly corporeal you know everything that this man is writing about is is based in his body and 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 by showing things and signifying things with his body so you know you know corporeal mortification you know and then also corporeal ecstasy is a part of that and so when he's telling you that he considers to be the lover of jesus that he's doing these romantic things he means that whether or not that is like particularly like you know like being gay is a new idea and they and they simply don't have it but you know he's telling you that he feels romantic love for jesus and like believe him right like that's what that's what he's saying so i mean the other other thing i find fascinating about suso is that his the, the the collection of his writings was translated from like middle high German is translated into English as like the exemplar. Like he's this guy that we should be looking up to, right? He's this guy who's, who's telling us how we should do it. So like how, so he didn't, he talks again, he wasn't showing off his, like his cool little horny Jesus tattoo. Um, he said he only showed one person, but like how, how, how common was this kind of mortification and this kind of flagellation and, and when and how did it kind of fall out of favor in, in, well, in, in in religious in Christian teaching, so a big part of it is that um, you know it's always kind of in favor if you hide it, and um, so but like the hiding is necessary for it, and the hiding of it is that otherwise people think you're bragging. Right. And so there's this specific thing. So you'll, you'll see a lot, uh, for example, when we have like royal saints, which is like one of the main flavors of saints that you get in the medieval period is royal. Um, and so a big part of that is that you have to secretly wear a hair shirt underneath your very fine garments because you're still doing the things that are expected of you as a king. But you're also mortifying your flesh by wearing this hair garment. And that that is like bog standard. Like you, you definitely have to do that. Most saints are like it, it, to a certain extent will wear her hair shirts like this is a very very common thing like it's it's not at all um unusual but you cannot see, be seen to be flaunting it and we see this all the time within medieval christianity is there's this real uh balance that one has to hit so for example um even if we're having conversations about like just overt sexuality and uh, uh for example i think it's augustine who's St. Augustine, who says that uh, it's actually better to be uh, someone who's had sex and they're kind of ashamed of it than it is to be a virgin who's proud of it. (laughs) 
right? Because it's like, you can't be, you shouldn't be doing it because you're proud. You shouldn't be doing it to show off. You shouldn't be saying, oh yeah, well, this is like, look how holy I am. I, I mortify my body. So the secretive nature of him carving Jesus's name on his heart is absolutely, it, it, it is indelible in, in terms of this. It's like, you cannot have both. You can't carve Jesus's name on your heart and then go around showing it, which is also kind of like part of the reason why I think you don't get a tradition of like tattoos for Jesus, right? Because it's like, like, oh, great, you know, like, oh, oh, you love Jesus, is it? Because then you're flexing and you shouldn't be doing that because pride is also one of the seven deadly sins. Right. right. And so right. I guess maybe a good place to end then is like when we start, when we do finally get tattoos for Jesus, which is, as I said earlier on, like, you know, probably a hundred years after the period we're, we're talking about specifically, um, uh, you know, in, in the middle of the 16th century. But I think it's interesting because, yeah, um, the Franciscans, um, you know, take control of Jerusalem and they set it up as this really important place of pilgrimage. They want to make a little bit of money and like tattooing becomes a big part of it. And there's been long been kind of talk about, or, or, or certainly, I don't know if it's long been, but certainly there has been some some publication which claimed that this pilgrim uh, called Jan Ertz of Mecheln, a kind of Belgian pilgrim, was uh, tattooed in Jerusalem as early as the you know, mid 1400s. But essentially, like we found out, um, you know, t- it turns out really that like, although there's a version of his story where there is a story of him like finding a um, yeah 1484, describing a guy uh, tattooed with an image of St Catherine's martyrdom. When this knight was deceased, we found burnt on his body two whole wheels with the bleak palm passing through them and two double crosses worn by the Knights of Jerusalem, one wheel in front on his chest, the other on his back. So that's from like 1595. But given that his pilgrimage was purported to have taken place and the uh, earliest version of his manuscripts was about 1484, people have been like, oh, well, 1484, this, this tattooing was happening in Jerusalem. But actually, that story seems to have been added much later on, probably to make, because tattooing was by then a part of the pilgrim experience in Jerusalem, it was added, you know, a hundred years after this account to make it in the new edition feel more authentic and more like the modern period. Yeah. So, so we do start getting kind of, you know, tattooing is such an important part of like this experience of pilgrimage by, by the, by the late 1500s that we have to pretend it's been going on for much longer than it actually seems to have been. And, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really interested in, well, partly I, I wonder like, this is maybe where that dark ages quotes thing comes from, right? Because that, that kind of lack of sources does allow people to start making shit up. Yeah. Like it's much harder yeah, yeah. To, 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 to verify. And so if you are prone to kind of uh, telling a tall tale, um, the fact that the fact that we it's hard to check or, or impossible to know for sure be- makes that easy, right? Or easier. Yeah, it's it's quite interesting because it, it's definitely the sort of thing where you can simply say that something is true and like who's going to contradict you. But it's still rooted in the same kind of medieval thing of being like, well, things have to have a, an antique providence in order to be acceptable. Right, right. So yeah, it, it's right. Kind of, it does. Oh, that's it does interesting. Both things, yeah. Like so, because you know, medieval people are desperate, you know, to to go to the past, which is probably part of you know why they don't like tattoos because they're like, no, we're Romans. No, you shut up, you know. And like that's that's very important to them is how they are Romans. Um, and you know, similarly here, it's like, oh no, 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 no. It's totally fine. It's fine to get some tattoos. This guy had tattoos, right? And you know, one of the things that I could say is like this oh, is a so, world. So, so, so that's potentially a way of like authorizing that new business of being like, oh, hey, it's been going on for ages. Exactly. Ah. Exactly. It's like it's, it's like you know, since you know, fourteen eighty five. Right. For a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. For a hundred years, you know, and like, and hey, you know, that guy you've heard of, you know, Johanna Metz, you know, like you've heard of, you've heard of this guy. Hey, hey, well, he did it. Why not you? Like, come on down to, you know, like Ed's Tattoo Emporium. Right. <laughs> so it's, 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 you know, and you need to kind of appeal to that sensibility because, you know, whilst it is certainly, you know, a character, like in character from evil people, again, early modern people don't know that they're early modern. Right. right. They're just, right. they're like, Idiots. I'm a guy. Goddamn you know, idiots. Yeah. 
Yeah, like <laughs> fools. So you know they, they've still got this, they, they've still got the same desire to be kind of like part of you know heritage and to say that things have a lineage. And you know we 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 all kind of have that, right? I think all of us with tattoos like that lineage thing to a certain extent. You know, uh, you know when we 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 do call upon this. So you know it's it's fair enough that they're sort of doing that. But you know if what you're attempting to do is kind of make a case for why this thing you really like and that you want um, needs to happen, like, because there's a world that's essentially condemned this. You know, if you go, well, they were doing it 100 years ago and no one can kind of check up on it, they're like, hmm, all right, then if it's for Jesus. That's you know. absolutely fascinating. And I think, so, you know, where else, and this is a question I've asked you before, like, if we wanted to look out for more tattooing, where can where might we look because you know for me um, the, my research skills and my the languages i can speak and, and the things i'm looking for i'm sort of interested in how some of these like stories of like post new world encounter like stigmatics are potentially yeah. tattooed yeah but that's again a bit later like if i if i wanted to find or i want to kind of shout out to people who are maybe listening or even to you like if we wanted to find more tattoos between you know the ninth century European tattoos. I mean specifically between the ninth century and the and the fifteenth century. Like, where should we be looking? Like, where where are people like you who are looking for stories of everyday people's lives starting to look now? So, I mean, I think that a good place to look is exactly where you have done, which is we we need to look at these lives of people who are borderline saints. This is like this is a great this is a great place to look uh, because it's people who are doing really wild things with their body and they're recording it because if you don't have a record right then you're never gonna you're never gonna get sainthood right like you've got to have somebody write it down so that's an excellent place to lie to look especially because the ones are there are there are there ones of those that are you know sitting untranscribed well, or untranslated yeah sure like we, we find things all the time you know and in, in, if you if you're allowed like me well <laughs> with the death of the university and you know the ability to go research sure like that that's a problem but you know you find things like this and or you know like reading more carefully for those things but you know a big place for us to look is actually to ask our friends the archaeologists i think and what we need is more bog bodies <laughs> more bog bodies 2K22, I'm, I'm calling it, this is what we need, and, and we need stuff like that. And, and you get bog bodies, like A, you know, just dude who fell in bog. That's 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 a guy. Yeah, no, but none also, of those tattooed yet. No tattooed bog bodies have ever been discovered. Yeah, no, not yet, no. And, and But we also, I, I think a, a good and fruitful place to look would be, like, uh, sometimes you get uh, what you call atypical burials. I've been harboring on about this a lot lately because I've been doing a bunch of research. But um, sometimes if a, as someone was bad and you're worried that they're going to come back as the revenant dead and they're going to come like bite you or something in the night, uh, you go and you bury them in a bog on purpose because fuck that guy. And I, I, and I think, think they would I think also, yeah, and I think this is what Aaron said when he was on the show. Like, um, the, the we're also, there's been just literally like the last couple of weeks a new uh, a new paper coming out of like the Egyptian these Egyptologists that are doing this. As as we get in these new scanning technologies, like maybe some of those um bog bodies may yet reveal some tattooing. You know, although skin doesn't tend to survive in bog in the same way as it does in ice and, and desert. So yeah, I think I think that's that's really interesting and I think that's probably the the case. I mean we're we're also fighting with the bog bodies specifically. I tell this story in the book against the work of a guy called uh, uh, Alfred Dyke, a German, um, like historian of, of ancient Europe, Ironic who basically that he's made a bog shit person up. And his name is Dyke. Like, okay, but yeah, yeah it is, isn't it? Um, he ba- he basically like some 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 students went and like some PhD students went and like checked his stuff and basically realized that he made it all up. He talked a lot about sort of tattoo like tattoos on on bog bodies, but yeah, that's a really interesting thing. And I think uh, unlike anthropologists. Uh, I, I have a lot of love for archaeologists. Matt, I told you not to fucking fight with the anthropologists <laughs> hey, on, on the mate. show anymore. Come on. No, I, I love them. And, and I, do, I suppose that what it is, especially too, is I think that it's really useful for us to get kind of something like the, the only way for the medieval period, you can really get stuff from 
you know, the great majority of people, which are the ones who can't read and write, is we gotta go look at their bodies. And, like, obviously most of them are skeletal, unfortunately for us, so that, that'll that never tell us anything. But, you know, like, uh, once in a while we still do find them, and that's useful. And, you know, to be fair, like, even as a person who's interested in tattoos and who has tattoos and all of these things, right, I, you know, it still tells us something. Right. Like it's, it's, it's easy to say, OK, well, that's not useful for the history of tattooing. And I'm like, eh, I think it is right. Like it's interesting to kind of like look at how, you know, uh, social hierarchies are made, what tattoos can mean within these circumstances and how we establish, you know, groups of people. So like this is a story about Christendom. Right. Which is like the, the way medieval Europeans think about themselves. And that's why we have trouble you know, f- finding out more and that, you know, the absence of, of, uh, of something can be as interesting as the presence of it, frankly, if, if, if we're talking about something like tattoos that have such a long history, you know? And I think, I think that's a really good place to like, maybe, maybe end up because as I, as I've talked about a lot, you know, tattooing is something that in general has happens under clothing in the European context, at least it's invisible. Most of the time it's quite intimate. It's quite personal. There's not a tattoo industry um, and it's happening on people whose lives aren't recorded. And so, yeah, I think the presumption, even in the kind of, you know, in the historiography has been, well, it, we have, it, it's, I haven't, it's not written down anywhere, so it wasn't happening. But even these small little data points we've talked about today um, seem to suggest that, you know, marking your body permanently is not that difficult. Um, and it, while we can, I think we can be reasonably certain uh, as best as it is that this wasn't, you know, there wasn't some like mainstream practice or widespread practice of tattooing. Although I have come across people who've ha- said in general that maybe some- when something is very common, it's also not written about. Um, mm, yeah, because that's it's true. not worth yeah. noting. Like one of the one of the reasons that, uh, for example, maybe the the Spanish didn't write about tattooing very much is that what everyone knew it wasn't interesting. Yeah. Um, in yeah. the later period. But like I think, yeah, like I think we I think we can be reasonably sure that there wasn't this long standing like mainstream or, or, or widespread tradition of tattooing in Europe. Um but it seems unfathomable to me that like horny dudes like Suzo uh may not have discovered tattooing even independently, you know. Mm, mm. Yeah, exactly. And- on the note of uh, horny dudes, Eleanor, you have a book coming out specifically about horny dudes. Eleanor, tell us about your book, tell us about your podcast, tell us about everything about horny dudes. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, and horny dudes in the medieval case being horny chicks, obviously, because uh, uh, chicks are the dudes of the medieval period, um, and they rock. <laughs> chicks can be dudes, uh, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I've got a book coming out in, in the UK. It's going to be out in March. Um, in the US, it'll be out in uh, January. Um, it is called The Once and Future Sex, and it is about uh, gender roles in medieval society and now. And basically, I just uh, scream a lot about sexism, which is cool, uh, but uh, I've got a bunch of stuff about uh, beauty standards, sexuality, and also the concept of work uh, in that. Um, you can check out my podcast, which is called We're Not So Different, um, where, I don't know, Luke and I kind of fuck around and talk about medieval history and also other things we like. So that's fun. Um, and also I got a blog, which is going hyphen medieval.com, which I'm kind of too busy to have written on in the past month. Pew, pew, pew. Uh, but uh, I, I'm trying to get some more stuff up there, but um, I write about pop culture and medieval history there all the time. So uh, uh, check that out. Yeah. And and how how shitty nazis are in general yeah and how i hate nazis um and also uh how the only thing that will save the world is the proletariat coming together obviously That's where, exactly yeah. exactly and if you want to do a uh, community support you can support this podcast as well on patreon for as little as five quid a month you can get bonus episodes you can hear this episode at 11 p.m tonight after i edit it and you can't sleep for some reason uh, you can follow the show online at Beneath Skin Pod. You can follow me online at Got It at Guineas. That's G U Y N E Y S. You can follow Matt at Matt Lauder. You can also buy Matt's book, Painted People. Matt, g- give me the proper subtitle since I said it wrong on the last Ink Master episode. Uh, Painted People, Humanity, and 21 Tattoos. Um, 
Thank you. I say, I've said this in a couple of episodes. Thank you so much to the patrons who subscribed at our £15 level who are waiting free copies of the book. I am also... I am also waiting for the copies of the book. As soon as I get them to me, I will send them to you. The publisher are shipping them from Glasgow uh, is the exact quote that they sent to me, which appears to be further away than I imagined, given how long it's taken to actually deliver the books. But thank you for your patience, um, everyone that's waiting for a, a, a subscriber copy of the book. And yeah, everyone else, um, please go and buy it for your friends uh, or your enemies. Yeah. Flex all the Thank haters. Thank you very much from... <laughs> Fuck the haters. Uh, long live medieval horny dudes. Thank you very much. Bye.